What's up, Neon Life? How you guys doing this morning? Well, it is, it's, it's good to see you guys today. Uh, before I say anything else, I love to look into the camera and just uh, say, just welcome you online. If you are watching this online, I am so grateful you're along for the ride. I want to encourage you to open up your life to Jesus. Let him do the work that he wants to do. He can change your heart right to that, that, uh, that, that video camera right here that I'm looking at. And so I want to look at you and just say how good it is to see you. There's nothing better than being in God's house right here today with everybody. Amen, everybody. So uh, a couple of things before I get into this word that I, that I have for you today. Next Sunday, we have Baptism Sunday. And so if you've given your life to Jesus and you haven't taken that step, then I encourage you to do that. It's a declaration. Whenever you get baptized, you are declaring to the world that you belong to Christ. And so it's such a powerful statement that we do that. Um, also, I want to give a shout out to our amazing worship team. Come on, can we honor them? I mean, I don't, I don't say it enough, but they, they work so very hard to bring you the best worship that they can, and they, they are so phenomenal. Um, and, uh, and I really kind of say that because I, I want to encourage you. I mean, I know maybe there's some of you, because when you see a worship team, and they're, and they're so good, they really are, and you might be thinking, well, I feel like I'm gifted, or God's called me, um, and, and, you know, I play an instrument or whatever, I sing or play an instrument of some kind, uh, I can't get connected because, they're, they're, you know, this is just what it is, and it's not. This, they're a part of our serve team like any other part of our serve team here. And so if I believe in, in you fulfilling the purpose that God has created you for, and so if that is, is being on the worship team, uh, don't shy away from the process. They do have a process of getting involved in the worship team, but uh, don't shy away from that. If you, if you want to know your next step, uh, it is our growth track class. We don't have one coming, in, coming up in August, but we do have one coming up. I think it's going to be September 3rd. It's going to be our next one. Uh, and so uh, I encourage you, go online, uh, sign up for Growth Track. Um, there's a serve team application all, also on there. You can click, I uh, want to be a part of the worship team. And uh, Colton here will be talking with you because that's, they want, we want to grow every single team. I believe that, you know, we want to get people connected, becoming a part of the body of Christ. You're just fulfilled when you do that. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's awesome when you're pouring your life out for Jesus in the way that he's called you to because when you get out of, like it gets you out of bed and gets you stirred, gets you moving, it motivates you and it just, it just fires you up. And so um, also something that we have beginning uh, in, on August the 8th, we do two seasons of this every year. As a matter of fact, if you were to be involved in one thing at Neon Life Church and say, I'm just going to commit myself to one thing, this would be the one thing, 21 days of prayer. Uh, it's August the 8th through the 28th. Um, it is life changing. It's a season of 21 days where we are going after God. Believing God for big things. I mean, we're, I always say it like this. Let's pray prayers that just sound ridiculous. Ridiculous prayers. When they're coming out of your mouth, you're like, I can't believe I'm asking God and I'm seeking God for this. And it's not just that. We're praying for our community. We're praying for our state. We're praying for our government. We're, we're praying for our world. Uh, it's, we're praying for this church. I mean, it's just a season where we're just, we're, just, we're just praying God do a work in so many areas in my life and so many uh, the lives of so many, and so I just encourage you. It's a powerful, powerful season. If you want to know more, go to that website there, neonlifepeople.com slash 21 days. We provide also uh, uh, prayer guides for you adults, and we also, a couple of years ago, we started providing a, uh, a prayer guide for the kids, and I've noticed that some of you adults are actually carrying some of the kids' prayer guides, which I'm not mad about that. That's actually something I, I kind of have done the same thing because the prayer guide, the kids' prayer guides are really awesome. And uh, they got like coloring things in them and everything, but uh, those are completely free. We'll have those available here real soon for you, and you take as many of those as you want. They are yours. We want you to have those. They're, they're a useful resource for you. All right, so uh, today I want, to, I want to share with you guys uh, a message that, that God really has burdened my heart with. Um, as a matter of fact, when I was preparing for this message, the title of it is just Anchored in the Storm. And so I was preparing for it earlier in the week, and I was going to text Colton because there's a song that the worship team sings called Anchored. As a matter of fact, it's the third song, that they, the song they just got through singing. Um, it's just called Anchored, and it's, it's based off of Hebrews 6 and 19. And, uh, and I was going to text Colton and say, hey, would you mind doing that song because it's going to be perfect 
for the message. It would get people's hearts ready, and, and let's just do it. And I thought, well, before I text him, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look because they have all their, their set list on an on a, 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 on a app that I can go in and check and see what they're doing. And uh, I looked, and lo and behold, there it was right there, the song anchored number three. And I'm like, man, God, you're just working this out. I don't have to do anything. I love it. And, uh, and so I, I pray that you'll open your hearts up today to what God wants to do. I'm going to preach. Um, it might be a challenging message for some of you. It may not. I don't know. But I do pray that it's life-changing for you. My prayer is always the same, that we will leave this place changed, including myself. I'm, I'm not up here preaching at you. I'm preaching with you. You know what I mean? Like, I am with you in this thing. Don't think that I'm up here, got all my stuff all together. Uh, there's stuff that, matter of fact, it's kind of funny. I was talking to somebody uh, this week uh, about uh, preaching, and it's, it's like I said, and they said, yeah, um, usually, because they're a preacher too, and they usually will preach a message that, of things that maybe they're dealing with or that they have just dealt with, like seasons, and I'm like, yeah, it's, it's crazy because, you know, I might be going through something, and like, that's, that's my burden, and so I'm going to preach my burdens, you know, and, and so don't think for one second that I'm up here just, man, I've got this all just figured out, and I'm going to let y'all just get it all figured out, you know, it's not like that at all, and so I want to preach about uh, storms, but not so much just storms, it's really like, what do we do in, in a storm, like, and I'm talking about, I'm not talking about a, like, we need storms, we need some rain, everybody, but I'm talking about, um, like, a, like, spiritually, I'm talking about the, the trials and difficulties of life. Um, what do we do in the midst of storms? Like, how, we need to anchor ourselves, we need to be anchored in the storm so we're unmoving, we're unwavering. And I want to use one of my favorite stories in the Bible, one that all of you know, it's where Jesus calms the storm. And so I want to use two different books of the Bible, uh, Mark and Matthew. They're, they're, they're synoptic gospels, meaning they have a lot of the same stories, just the stories have some different details. And so I'm going to use two different books, uh, Mark first and Matthew, to kind of teach this story. But let me show it to you. And, uh, and I want you to kind of, when you're, when you're hearing this, put yourself in the place of the disciples. Because uh, I think that's how we would respond. I think our response would be very similar in the storm as that of the disciples. And so in Mark chapter 4, uh, it says that day. Now, so first, Jesus had just got done preaching a lot of sermons, right? And, and so he was, he was actually, i got to give you a little context here. He was at the Sea of Galilee or the Lake of Galilee, and he was out in a boat. They, pushed, they, they put him in a boat when he'd go to preach to all these thousands of people. They'd kind of push him off the shore a little bit. And the reason why they would do that, it, was, it would amplify his voice. It was kind of like having a PA system. And so he'd be kind of out in the boat off the shore, and the water would actually echo his voice, and so it carried better. And so he's out on this, he's out, just finished preaching. It says, that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, and I want you to grab hold of this. He said, let's go over to the other side. Now, there's details in this story that I think a lot of us, we probably read and overlook. But this is such an important detail. Because Jesus said, we're going to go to the other side. Now, the disciples did not know that they were going to encounter a storm in the middle of the lake. But Jesus did. And Jesus knew there was going to be a storm, and yet he still said, we're going to go to the other side of this. So don't think for one second that we're not going to make it to the other side. And the disciples probably just thought that was a casual thing like, let's go. Let's go and um, set sail. You know, let's, let's get moving. But Jesus was making a very powerful statement to the disciples if they would have just grabbed hold. I think they missed it. I think whenever he said it, they just, they didn't, they didn't receive what he said. And and so he said, let's go to the other side. And I love that statement. And the reason why is because when Jesus says it, you can count on it. So he said, let's go to the other side. And he said, leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was. He was already in the boat, right? And there were also other boats. So there was like a convoy of other boats. The disciples, they were all there together. And then the storm happened and it says a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat. So it wasn't just like a, run-of-the-mill, everyday storm, it was a furious storm. Crystal and I had the opportunity to go to Israel, and when we were there, we, uh, we, we, we got to go out on a boat out in the middle of, I call it the Lake of Galilee, because it's a, it's a freshwater body, but it's, it's huge. It's, it's big. It's just like round. I mean, it's, it's not like Possum Kingdom Lake where it's snaky. It's just a big, round body of water. And so the smallest amount of wind actually can create, you can see how it could create 
like eight foot waves. They actually said that eight foot waves are actually normal in, in, in moderate winds on, this, on the Lake of Galilee. So you could see how easily the, the, the water would get really rough and really scary. And it said that the furious squall that came up, this storm came up, and the waves, they were breaking over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. And Jesus, check it out, my favorite part, I love it. It's just Jesus being Jesus, right? He was, he was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. That is my Savior right there. But the disciples in the middle of this storm Picture it. I picture a Three Stooges like show at this. At, I just picture something chaotic. I picture the disciples just running and bumping into each other and they're mad at each other. And, 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 and there they look and lo and behold, there is Jesus not panicking. He's asleep on a cook. I love that. Like he's not panicking in the middle of a storm. That, that, that's very powerful to me. Because that tells me if he's not panicking, that must mean that he's got a plan, everybody. In the middle of the storm, he's got a plan. He was calm. He was cool. He was collected. And the disciples, the Bible downplays this way too much for me. Because it's a furious storm. The boat's about to capsize. And it just says casually, the disciples woke him up. Now, this was not a, like a little, hey, like a love pat, Hey, Jesus, are you up yet? Hey, 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 little twinkle eyes. I mean, you know, like, it, it, what, I picture this. I picture when the disciples woke him up, like, they woke him up. Like, get up. Panic. Run around, Jesus. Act scared. Scared. And they, so they woke him up. And they, and they made this statement, which is a very powerful statement. They said, teacher, don't you care if we drown? Like, we're not going to make it. As if Jesus didn't already tell them that we're going to go to the other side. They forgot. They forgot what Jesus had told them in the very beginning before the storm even hit, that they were going to make it to the other side. I think we're just like the disciples, everybody. I think I can relate to this so very much. Like, God, do you not even care about me? Do you not even see what I'm going through? Do you have no idea, God? I mean, does it even matter to you? It's like we forget before, like God has made these promises to us. We either forget what God has promised us or we think that we were wrong. Or we think that God, like we misheard God. Or we think that God was wrong. We start questioning our very faith, just like the disciples were doing. They were like, God, you don't even... You could care less about this. Like, you don't even, do you even care? And so now we pick up with the story in Matthew chapter 8. Same story. The the storm has come up. The disciples run around, bumping all over everybody. Wake up, Jesus! And and now we have Jesus' response here in Matthew chapter 8. Jesus rubs his eyes and is like, and here's his response. He says, you of little faith another very powerful point there because notice what Jesus did he responded to the disciples before he responded to the storm Jesus woke up and he wasn't panic he didn't he didn't wake up and be like oh my gosh wind and waves stop he looked first the disciples and he addressed them before he addressed the storm that they were in And that's very powerful. And the reason why it's powerful is because Jesus understood the power in him versus the power of that storm. And Jesus said, you have have little faith. He said, why are you so afraid? I I, I can imagine if if Peter were in the boat, which he probably wasn't, because if Peter were in the boat, then there would be a lot more to this story. Like there's something that would happen. Like Peter was crazy, like, Something would have happened. I don't know what would have happened. Like, I don't, I have no idea, but it would have been like a Peter moment. He was probably in the other boat screaming across the water at Jesus. And so it, Jesus says, you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? Then he gets up and he rebukes the wind. I love 
like the power of God that even the wind and the waves and the storm, they listened to him. Like a furious storm, he got up, rebuked the wind and the waves, and it was completely calm. Here's another powerful statement. Notice this one right here. The men, the disciples, were amazed, and they said, who is this guy? They completely forgot who Jesus was in the middle of the storm. Like, what kind of man is this that even the wind and the waves respond to him? They completely forgot who Jesus was. That before the storm, the disciples only thought they knew Jesus. But in the storm, they realized that there's a part of Jesus that they never knew that they know that they need. Because storms will reveal something. Storms, we don't like them, but they reveal a part of our faith that needs work. Storms in our life will reveal a place in our life, our faith, that we see needs work. And God needs us to see it. I believe that's why Jesus first responded to the disciples because he said, you have little faith. He, he needs them to know the place where you need work before he responds to the storm. Because God wants to do a work in your life that supersedes any storm you're encountering. And so you may not have saw it in this story, but there's actually three storms that take place in this story. And the first storm that happened was a physical storm. The disciples' storm was very real. It was wind, it was rain, it was thunder, it was, it was, it was lightning. But when I say have faith and trust God, I'm not talking about ignoring the fact that you're in a very real physical storm. That a lot of times your very real physical storms require you to take real steps in order to walk through that storm. But the problem is, and this is what really disturbs me as your pastor, and, and, and even, it even happens to me too, the problem is, is we will allow a, a physical storm to turn into something that it never should have been, like hurt relationships, bad tempers, separation, broken marriages. Like we will allow a, a, a physical storm to actually turn into something that it never, ever should have been. I mean, how many of you have ever done that? You've taken a storm, and it's a real storm, like it's a real thing you're going through, a difficult thing, and you've actually turned it into something that it never should have been, right? I, I, I've done that a lot. I was preparing this message, and I thought of one time in particular. And there was, there was a time where, uh, so I remember Crystal came home. She just went grocery shopping. It was early in the day. And she had bought some Bluebell ice cream. I think it was Rocky Road. I can't remember exactly. But it was one I liked. And she, she puts all the groceries up and everything. Later that day, probably in the evening, I go in the kitchen. I'm ready for some Rocky Road, some Bluebell, right? I didn't say Ben and Jerry's. I said Bluebell, right? We lived in, we lived in up north. And, and if I mention Bluebell, they're like, who? What? And, and they say, no, we like Ben and Jerry's. I'm like, who's Ben and Jerry? Like, they don't even, anyway, that's a whole other story. I'm like, you guys don't even know. I mean, I'm talking about Bluebell ice cream, right? And so I go in there to get me some Bluebell ice cream. I look in the freezer. We have one of those little drawer pull-out freezers on the bottom. And I'm like, hey, Crystal, where'd you put the Bluebell? I don't see it in here. She goes, well, I put it up. So I shut it. I opened up the refrigerator. It's sitting right in the middle of the and it's completely thawed out. Uh, I, I just mm, shut the door, and I'm, I'm I'm like sulking. I'm like pouting. Let's just go ahead and call it what it was, right? And for the rest of the evening, we were we were like bickering at one another. Like we were, I was just like. Yeah, you watch what you want to watch. No, I watch what I want to watch. Now listen to me. Over melted ice cream, y'all. I mean, come on. Now I understand that a lot of times the storms that we go through, they're far 
more serious and, you know, than, than, than melted ice cream. I, I get that. I'm just trying to make a point that oftentimes what we do is we take a physical storm that we're going through and we amplify it up to be something so much worse than it has to be. Because if we're not careful, it, it can actually turn into another storm. It can actually turn into an emotional storm, which is the second storm. A physical storm, it's a real storm. It can actually turn into something that doesn't have to be, which is an emotional storm, which can be you know, separation and, and broken relationships and hurt feelings. And with the disciples' case, although they were facing a very real storm, it turned into, we're going to drown. Like, their very real storm all of a sudden turned into, like, we're not going to make it. We're going to drown. They forgot that Jesus said we're going to go to the other side. Completely forgot what Jesus had already said. I want you to know this today. That when Jesus said it, you can count on it. That what the Bible promises you, I'm going I'm to tell you this today, I promise you, you will make it to the other side. The Bible promises you that. You have the victory. Jesus says he'll never leave you, nor will he ever forsake you. 2 Corinthians 1 and 20, I think is what it is. It says no matter how many promises God has made, they're, they're always yes and they're always amen. Every single time. We just have to be very careful that our physical storm doesn't turn into we're all going to drown. Because then it can quickly turn into this third storm, which is a spiritual storm. That remember the disciples said to Jesus, don't you care? Does this even matter to you? And if we're not careful, we can begin actually making statements about God that are neither true or even biblical. God, you don't even care about me. God, where are you in my situation? Do you even see me? You don't even care. I mean, the disciples got in the middle of their storm and they they completely forgot who Jesus even was. In the middle of their storm, Jesus is right there. They completely forgot who Jesus was. That storms have a way of of revealing our depth of faith and relationship with God. They're not a bad thing. Matter of fact, storms are something that we need to embrace, and that's difficult. It's the most difficult part of our faith is that storms are a part of our faith that we need to embrace. So so really, here's the question right here. What if the real miracle wasn't about Jesus calming the storm on the outside? What if the real miracle was, was about Jesus calming the storm on the inside? What if the real miracle wasn't about Jesus just taking care of the problem? What if the real miracle was Jesus saying, I want to do a work in you that far supersedes the storm that's happening all around you? And I'm guilty of this. Like, I will pray, like, God, get this storm out of my life. God, do something. And I forget that God wants to do a work, a miracle in my life. And this is a difficult pill to swallow, but there's no better place for God to do a work in your life than through a storm in your life. That's hard. I know it. I I understand. Now, I don't believe God creates the storm because he wants to teach you something, but God uses the storm to teach us something, to reveal some things. He needs you to see it. Like, he knows where you're weak. He knows the parts of your life that need work. He just needs you to see it. Because if you can see it, then you'll let God deal with it. You'll begin to allow God to work with it. And so the storms actually reveal some things that we need to see in our life. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 through 18. Say this first line right here. So we're not giving up. We're not giving up. How could we? Even though on the outside, it often looks like things are falling apart all around us. On the inside, that's where God is making new life. Man, that's so good. Not a day goes by without his unfolding grace. These hard times are, there's a typo, because it's small potatoes. It's not potatoes. It's potatoes. These hard times are small potatoes compared to the coming good times. 
the lavish celebration prepared for us. There's far more going on around you than meets the eye. The things we see now are here today and gone tomorrow. But the things we can't see now will last forever. Listen to me. God wants to do a work in you that supersedes him calming the storm. He wants to develop in you something in you that anchors your faith. That in spite of the storm, regardless of the wind, regardless of the waves, you are anchored to something that keeps you unmoving. Hebrews 6 and 19 says we have this hope as an anchor. We just sang it. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul that's firm and secure. Real storms are going to happen and we're going to make it to the other side, but there has to be something that creates in us a hope that's firm and secure. You know, Crystal and I, we, 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 had a, we, we bought a boat like years ago, like back in the 90s. We still have this boat. This boat will not break down. I've told Crystal, if this boat will just break down and we'll start having problems with it, we'll get another boat. The boat won't break down. I think God's hand is on it. <laughs> and I, I, just, I'm, I just won't. Like, I mean, it's like, this, I'm not even kidding. One time I was pulling the boat in my truck. Some girl runs a stop sign, T-bones the boat, knocks the boat into the bed of my pickup. I got pictures of this. I mean, the boat is sitting in the bed of the pickup. I'm like, yes, totaled out, man. Still runs. <laughs> the boat's like, no, I ain't done yet. <laughs> oh, great boat, though. It's awesome. I've told many people that it broke down in newer boats. On my, it's, it's always kind of a joy for me. It's like, yeah, my boat's about 40 years old, man. I'll hook you up. I'll, dra I'll drag your 2020 back to the, back to the boat ramp. Uh, <laughs> um, but anyway, anyway, sorry. We, well, I have this anchor. Where's, the, where's, the, where's, my, where's my anchor boy? <laughs> anchor man. He's an anchor man. <laughs> um, so this is the anchor that we had, we had, this is our anchor of choice for years right here, okay? Uh, this is your run-of-the-mill, just get by kind of anchor that you would use. We'd drop this anchor and we'd, we would swim. Well, every time I would drop this, this anchor, it has to be dropped on the, on the rock. I mean, you like need some, some rocks so it can kind of grab and dig hold of those rocks. Well, where we're dropping is usually sand, is mud or grass or something like that. And it would never hold. I would, we'd jump off and swim. And the whole time I'm like floating in the water at the, the rope. And I'm like, set, set, anchor set. You know, I'm just like, man, it's just so frustrating. So I thought one day I'm going to deal with this anchor problem. I'm going to get an anchor that actually holds. Because this thing right here, this little run of the mill. Oh, yeah, you're supposed to bring it to me. This little... We went, we rehearsed this before. All right. Yes, I do. Thank you. Of course I got it. Ugh, look at that. Okay. <laughs> now this right here, this bad boy is about 35 pounds, right? Even put a big old chain on the end of it. That way, whenever we get to somewhere, as a matter of fact, um, Colton, he's not sitting there. I picked on him first service, but he, he's, he's, ask him how heavy it is because he's my anchor guy, like. Whenever we get ready to drop anchor, pull anchor up, Colton's the guy to do it right there. Because I'm sitting at the steering wheel. I can't move, right? <laughs> Colton, has, Colton has asked me, can we not just get a motor that pulls it up? I'm like, why? We got you. <laughs> of course not, man. Look at that. I mean, and so I would just drop this anchor and not even worry about it. It doesn't even matter. I'm just, I say I. Colton would just drop this anchor and I wouldn't have to worry about it because regardless of the wind and whatever's happening, this anchor sets because it's the right anchor. You get my point? Like, we need the right anchor to anchor our lives to something that keeps us unmoving, unwavering, despite a storm, despite the wind. And some of us are using just a run-of-the-mill, just get by kind of anchor, and you're wondering why you're struggling trying to get yourself anchored. It's because you're not using the right anchor, everybody. You need to get the right anchor. You need to get an anchor that actually holds your faith. So how do we do that? I want to give you three things. How, we, how our faith is anchored. The first one is this, is we are anchored when we cultivate God's presence. Now this one, I can't, the only way for you to understand this is for you to experience it. I can't explain to you God's presence. You have to experience God's presence to understand even what I'm talking about. 
So let me say it this way. God's presence is always available. God's presence is always there. You've got to position yourself in a certain way in order to cultivate the presence of God. Now, there's two powerful ways you can cultivate the presence of God. The first way is worship. I mean, just, just push away the distractions like, you know, get some headphones, play some worship music. Man, if you, if you don't know what good worship music is or you don't have any or whatever, if you happen to have Spotify, Neon Life Church has a Spotify playlist with some great worship on there. But get you some worship music and, and just begin to worship God. You don't even need music, as a matter of fact, to worship God. You can worship without music. I just like music because it just kind of helps me cut the distractions and just start to worship him. But worship is powerful because what worship does is it takes your storm, it takes your problem, your difficulty, and it actually holds it up and compares it to the size of God. And you realize how small your problem is versus how big God is. So your problem becomes, goes from very big, so when you worship God, your problem goes to very small because God is so big. Worship is extremely powerful. The next thing that we do to cultivate the presence of God is prayer. Like prayer actually invites God into your situation. Prayer gives God an open invitation for God. This is not supposed to rhyme. I did it first service. Prayer gives God an open invitation to get involved in your situation. I don't know why. (laughs) But prayer gives God full reign and authority to get involved in your life. It's like, God, I need you. God, I'm I'm surrendering this to you. Like, the presence of God is where I feel most comfortable because I'm reminded, God, like you love me. When I get into the presence of God, I'm just reminded, God, you love me so much. I'm reminded of of God's power, his presence, his, his love for me. It's never condemning either. I've never gotten to the presence of God and felt condemned by God. I've never felt like God is mad at me. I've always felt, God, you love me so much. And it's just despite all of me. Like, how can you love me like you do? And, I, and it's like God's presence does that. And the only way you're going to experience that is if you, just, if you just intentionally position yourself to experience God's presence. The only way it's going to happen. Look at what Psalm 91 says. Uh, it says, those who live... Now, the word live, there's other translations that actually use the word dwell. I love the word dwell. Like, think of a dwelling, like a home. So in other words, the presence of God is a place that you're so comfortable with, it feels like home. Like, it's a place where you just feel, you feel at rest. You feel like you can just lay back and just enjoy this moment because you're in a place that just feels like home to you. That's God's presence. And it says those that, that, that dwell, those who live in the shelter of the Most High, they will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Like storms are everywhere. And regardless of what's going on around you, whenever you're in the presence of God, it feels like home. Let me just say it this way. That rest isn't the absence of our problems. It's not the absence of our storms, but rest is the presence of God. It's the presence of God. And it says, he goes on to say in Psalm 91, that this I declare about the Lord. If we're going to experience God's presence, let's declare some things in Jesus' name. That he alone is my, my refuge. He is my place of safety. He is my God. I mean, I'm talking in the middle of your storm. Let's declare this right here. That he is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust him. And I highlighted all these I wills right here because I want you to be reminded. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect. Let's make it personal. He will, he will rescue me from every attack and, and protect me from deadly disease. He will cover me with his feathers. He will shelter me with his wings. His faithful promises are my armor and my protection. I'm telling you, when you know how great God is, you can't help but to want to be in the presence of God. And so I want to encourage you that in the middle of your storm to push away some stuff. Push away the news and push away some social media, everybody. Let me just say it this way. Give God twice as much time as you're given to the news and social media. Some of you are going to have to cut your social media and have to even fit that in your day. 
So you don't need so much news. I mean, it's not, like, listen to me, you don't need to know everything, right? It's okay. Too much information, man, it just wears you out. Some of us need to just get some time and spend some time, get some time alone and just spend some time with God. Get in his presence, listen to him, hear what he says about you. I could tell you right now what he's going to say about you, but I need, you need to go and hear that for yourself. Because God loves you. God adores you. God wants nothing but to spend more time with you. And it's, 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 it's priceless because when you get into the presence of God, it anchors you. Because you know what God says about you in spite of the storm. I can't tell you being a pastor how many times people has had negative things to say about what I do. Like, it's all the time. And I, but I know what God says about me. And in spite of what the world says, in spite of what anybody else says about me, I know where I'm anchored. And I know who God says that I am. And I am unwavering and unmoving. The only way that anchor is moving is if God takes that anchor and moves it for me. Because he is my anchor. Here's the next thing that will anchor us is we're anchored when we remember God's promise. That when we remember God's promise, if God said it, if it's in his word, then nothing can take that away. That there's nothing more secure than just the promises of God, than what God has promised us. Isaiah 55 and 11, here's what God says. He said that my word that goes out from my mouth, like we're gonna make it to the other side, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. You have the victory. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Like my word that goes out from my mouth, it will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. David said this. He said, my soul faints. Like I got storms all around me. I don't know what to do. He said, my soul faints with longing for your salvation, but I have put my hope in your word, and we need to do that. We need to put our hope in the word of God. That despite what the news says, whatever social media says, regardless of what the doctors say, can I tell you this? God has the final word. God has the final word. It's not what the news media says. It's not what the government says. It's not what social media says. It's God has got the final word. That his promises, as many as he's made, doesn't matter how many he's made, they're always yes and they're always amen. That he gets the final word. And here's the third thing right here that anchors us, is we're anchored when we understand God's process. This is difficult. Because I I believe, I truly believe this, I believe that if the disciples would have just remembered, like they're in the middle of this storm, Moments earlier, Jesus said, we're going to go to the other side. Now, I believe that if the disciples had remembered that Jesus said, we're going to make it to the other side, I believe they would have responded completely different. That's why Jesus addressed them before he addressed the storm. It's because he knew they forgot. He said, you have little faith. He knew their faith had some issues. He knew their faith had some faults in it and some cracks in it. He said, I need you to see these areas in your life first. I believe that's what Jesus does for us too. Like, yes, go and pray for these storms that's in your life. I I think you need to. I'm going to pray about these storms. But God's going to always address you before he's going to address the storm because God wants to do a work inside of you. And a storm is the best place for him to do it. A difficult time in your life, it's the best place. That's when your hearts are vulnerable and you're willing to listen to God. And God knows this. And God loves you so much. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He just wants to do a work in you. Romans 5 and 2 through 4 says, We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Thank you, God, for the hope that you give us, right? Not only so, but check it out. We also rejoice in our sufferings. That's crazy. Like we rejoice because of suffering, like why? 
How in the world could we ever rejoice in our suffering? Because suffering produces perseverance. And perseverance produces character. And character produces that hope that we all need. And so suffering is something we can anchor our faith to. And that's difficult. And I know it is. It's not easy. We want to get through life as stormless as possible. But we need the rain, right? Because storms bring the harvest. We need it. And so suffering is something we have to, as believers, as difficult as it is, we just have, we have to embrace it. As God, what do you want to show me through this? So let me, I'm going to, I'm going to make you hungry. Not spiritually hungry. Hopefully you're spiritually hungry, but I'll make you physically hungry and I can't help it. I got to use this illustration to do that. Uh, but I love a good steak. Now, when I say I love a good steak, I ain't talking about, I'm not talking about don't go to Cracker Barrel to get a good steak, right? I'm talking about like my favorite meal, hands down, is a good quality. Like you give me a good quality steak, man, I will forsake all other, all other items, donuts and everything. Like, I don't need anything else. Give me a good steak. I'm talking about a steak that's been aged right, seasoned right. It's got that good little char. And it's, and it's hear me out, everybody. It's medium rare on the inside. Yeah. My kind of people. First service didn't even clap about that one. <laughs> Not well done. All right? If I'm ever cooking you a steak and I say, I say how do you want it done? I'm, it's rhetorical. I'm going to cook it medium rare for you. Because I just, I get, I get teary-eyed watching a steak get, yes. get killed on the grill. Like, I'm, I'm killing the steak here, man. All right, anyway, let's just, let's move on because this is a good illustration. And so, you want a good steak, right? When you go to a restaurant that gives you a good steak, you're always going to do the same thing. Any restaurant that, that serves really quality steaks, they're going to they're gonna say, cut into it, right? Because the cutting reveals whether it's done or not. And if it's not done, if you cut into it and it's not done, it goes back in the fire. And that's a, that's a truth that you can anchor yourself to. And it's not easy. But the cutting reveals, the difficulty reveals whether or not you need more time in the fire. But we don't like the fire, right? God, I don't want to go back in the fire. But here's our prayer, that God... If it's part of your process to get me where you want to get me, to make me perfect, to make me like you want me to be, then God, I'm going to trust your process. But in the middle of this process, God, would you do that miracle work inside of me? Can that be our prayer today? God, do a miracle work in me. Let's just bow our heads. Let's pray that today. Prayer team, you can come up to the front. Come on, let's invite God to do that miracle work. God, do the work inside of me. The storm I'm encountering right now, that what's going on in my life, God, it's not easy. But God, what do you want me to learn through this season? God, I need you more than ever. God, I pray that you would reveal some things to me through this season. Show me, God, so, I'll, I, so I can begin to pray and seek you more and surrender things to you, God. Thank you, God, that you love me this much. Now, with every head bowed, if I just want to just make this simple. If you don't know Jesus, today's your day to know him. He died for you. He gave his life for you. And you cannot live your life without him. I'm just going to tell you. I would not want to go through a storm without Jesus sitting in my boat on a cushion. I just wouldn't. And you need him there. And if that's you and you want to invite him into your life, it's as simple as just saying, God, I surrender my life to you, that you just give him your heart. Just do that. Just say, Jesus, I surrender to you. I give you my life. I give you all of me. And God, I know I'm, I haven't been doing things like you want me to do them, but God, today I'm surrendering to you. God, thank you for loving me right where I am. Thank you that your son, Jesus, gave his life on the cross for me. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. And I give my life to you. I surrender to you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.
Amen. Church, can you stand to your feet? If you made that decision today, I am, couldn't be more proud of you. Uh, take that connection card if you don't mind and let us know the decision that you made. Drop in the offering box on your way out because we want to help you take another step in your faith. So very important. If you need prayer for any reason whatsoever, we have a prayer team up here in the front. We would love to pray with you. If you made that decision today, then we'd love to pray over you today. Then come on down to the front as we worship for just a moment longer. Come on, everybody. Let's stretch our hands and our hearts out. Come on and sing this. Come on, every voice. You gave everything to save the world you love. And this hope is in Hope. There is hope in the promise of